I was reading a lot of tech books that are good, that are a compilation of troublesome cases. But what I wasn't seeing is the realization that the root of the problem is the business model of exploiting personal data. Hi, I'm Taylor Owen, and this is Big Tech. The other day, The Markup came out with a story about a family safety app, basically an app that tracks your kids, that had been selling the location data of its 33 million users without their knowledge. Which was disturbing, but maybe not surprising. By and large, I think people know that our apps and our devices are siphoning our data. But even with that knowledge, you might be taken aback by the degree to which this is happening. The data broker Axiom claims to have data on 2.5 billion people around the world. Another broker, CoreLogic, says they have real estate and property information on 99.9% of Americans. Our relationship with privacy is kind of a paradox. Generally speaking, we do care about privacy. Pew Research found that 81% of people think the risks of commercial data collection outweigh its benefits. And yet we continue to bring tools of data extraction into our lives. Instagram and TikTok, Google Homes, Alexas, and Ring doorbells. But if there's anyone who will convince you that you really need to start protecting your data, it's Carissa Valise. Carissa is a philosophy professor at Oxford and the author of Privacy is Power. She makes a compelling argument about why and how we should try and take back control of our data. Not least of which is that data exploitation is the root of surveillance capitalism and all of its harms. And emerging technologies will only provide more opportunities for data extraction. What will privacy look like in the metaverse or when we've augmented our minds or edited our genetic code? If we want to protect our data in the future, we need to figure out how to do so right now. Here's my conversation with Carissa Valise. I, w- I want to talk about surveillance capitalism and our data economy and um, your views on on the effect of those and, and what we should do about it. Um, but more generally, why to you does privacy as a concept matter? Well, I'm not sure that I think about privacy as mattering as a concept. It's more like I'm worried about the implications of not having privacy. But essentially, I think that privacy is important for individual well-being. I think individuals are the kinds of creatures that, on the one hand, we need community to thrive. We need to have other people around us. But at the same time, we need to be able to withdraw from society at certain points and to have moments and times of relaxation, of intimacy with very close others, but far away from the gaze of strangers. And if we don't have enough privacy, uh, we don't have enough autonomy, both as individuals, but also as as a citizenry. I mean, that's a, that seems to be an important point in your work, that privacy isn't just an individual concept with individual implications about agency and autonomy, but actually it has collective implications. And that it's, a, that it's, it's important as a collective, as a society, that we each have this individual thing. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, that's right. I think lately there has been a misunderstanding that privacy is something completely individual. And, and maybe it's it's partly caused by the idea that privacy is related to personal data and personal sounds like very individualistic. Um, But there are a few reasons for why privacy is a collective endeavor and for why society has an interest that individuals have privacy. One reason is that whenever I share my personal data, I'm generally sharing personal data about others as well. So if I share my genetic data, I'm sharing data about my parents, about my siblings, about my cousins, but they might have very bad consequences from that. For instance, they could be denied life insurance or they could be deported, something that has already happened actually in Canada. There's a case. Mm. Um, And the other reason is that even if my data was only individual, it has consequences on the greater society. So perhaps the best illustration is the Cambridge Analytica scandal in which only 270,000 people gave their data to Cambridge Analytica, this political firm 
And then the political firm got access to the data of 87 million Facebook friends of those people who didn't consent and didn't give, didn't even know about it. And then with that data, the political firm uh, designed a tool that could profile voters around the world. So it seems like the actions of 270,000 people impacted whole countries and democracies around the world. And it seems like if both of those cases are true, then we don't have the moral authority to sell or share our data like we have the moral authority to sell our house. Um, so I don't think we should think about personal data as property. And I don't think that we should think about privacy as something merely individual. Yeah. I feel like 10 years ago, it would have been really understandable for individuals to not necessarily care about the way their data was abused or know how their data was being used. Um, but that's much less so the case now. I mean, there's pretty wide understanding due to things like Cambridge Analytica that, that there are potential abuses and that trade-off is much more more sort of clear in people's mind. And yet we live in a time when we give it, we seem even more willing than ever to give away these data and to bring things like smart speakers into our homes. And I mean, what's causing this? Like, why, are we, why do we as individuals face such a tough time understanding this trade-off and changing our behavior accordingly? We used to care a lot about privacy and it was very obvious for why we should care about privacy. There's a reason why it's in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And partly it had to do with the fact that it was very tangible how losses of privacy could damage us. So for instance, if you went to a job interview and the interviewer asked you whether you were planning to have kids anytime soon, it was very obvious how the answer to that question could affect your chances of getting the job. And now the same thing might happen, It might, but it's just so invisible and so indirect that you might lose a certain amount of data points today. Uh, you asked for a job six months down the line or maybe a year down the line. Your prospective employer buys uh, your, your file from a data broker. It infers that you might want to have a family and maybe you don't get the job, but you'll never figure that out. So it's much more invisible to us. And, and that's part of it. When When people think about their personal data being collected. It's very abstract, it's very invisible. But I think if people knew more details about the kind of data that is collected and the kind of inferences that are drawn, I think we would be more wary of it. So for instance, people might think, well, I don't care whether Facebook or Spotify knows my tastes in music, but if those mm -hmm. tastes are being used to calculate things like your sexual orientation or maybe whether you're depressed or not, and then people might think, well, yeah, I actually don't, don't want those companies to have that information. So that's, that's one aspect. Another aspect for why I think people are not careful enough with their data is that they're not aware of how much power they have on the one hand, how much these companies depend on our personal data to have the power that they do. And on the other hand, they, I think people get the feeling that they, there's nothing they can do about it. It's like, okay, my data is already out there. We've lost this battle. Why should I make an effort or deprive myself of, of certain conveniences uh, to protect my, my personal data. And there, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done. On the one hand, to offer people alternatives. So instead of Google search, use DuckDuckGo. Instead of WhatsApp, use Signal. But also in showing how much of a difference it can make individually, but also collectively to take care of your personal data. The, the most valuable kind of personal data is the most recent one because personal data expires pretty quickly. People change their tastes, uh, they move houses, they lose weight or gain weight. And so companies always want the most updated data. So even if you feel like your data is already out there, because you're creating new data all the time, you can make a, a really big difference by protecting your data as of today. Yeah, that, that recency issue is something really interesting, I think, because it, it says something about the agency we might have in shifting some of these power balances. Um, if the bargain is, well, they already have years of data, therefore, why not keep giving it? And that's a very different trade off than actually my data today is much more valuable than my data from 10 years ago. Um, therefore, I can ch make some tangible difference by changing my behavior today. I mean, that's a very different construct, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's right. And also, I think people don't realize that we can ask companies to delete our data, certainly if you're a European. Mm. Well, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> depends where you live. <laughs> depends on your, where you live. But many companies don't want to give Europeans more rights than Canadians or Americans. And so they will treat everybody equally and you can ask them to delete it. Mm. D- does the nature of our technology infrastructure um, and the amount of data that's possible to collect, the way we use these services now versus last year versus 10 years ago, does that fundamentally change the concept of privacy? I don't think it's changed the concept of privacy. Privacy has always been about limiting the access that others have over you, access in terms mm. of information, or access in terms of um, kind of sensorial access, like people listening to you and people watching you. And it's still about that. So I don't think it changes the concept of privacy. I think what it changes is the ways in which our privacy is threatened, the ways in which we engage with our society and the kind of social contract that we're in. So a a lot of things around the practice of privacy changes, but I don't think the concept as such um, has changed a lot. I mean, I guess uh, building on that, I mean, you, you say in your book that reclaiming privacy is the only way we can regain control of our lives and our societies. And I guess I'm, I'm it kind of struck me, and I'm wondering to what degree you think we really have lost control here at the moment. It's a pretty grim landscape. But just to give you an example, like during the night, your phone will send information about where you've been throughout the day to a lot of apps and a lot of companies. And they do it at night such that um, you're, you don't notice that your battery is being drained. And then the moment you wake up, a lot of apps and companies get notice, notified of when you wake up, how well did you sleep? Are you looking up things at night that might suggest that you're worried about paying your loan back? Things like that. All kinds of things get processed and sent mm-hmm. to data brokers. So that's as an individual. I mean, clearly you've lost a lot, a lot of privacy. And how can that affect you? Well, it can affect you in many ways. Um, sometimes it's a, it's about whether you're being shown the same kind of opportunities than your neighbor. So for instance, men are typically shown ads for higher paying jobs than women. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has to do with the kind of prices you pay for the same services. So depending on whether you have a good laptop or not, you will pay a different price or, or depending on, or, on where you live. So we, we might get treated in, in different ways in many different contexts. But as a society, uh, like we saw in the case of Cambridge Analytica, w- our democracies are being distorted. So Cambridge Analytica identified, for instance, 3.5 million Black Americans who they thought were persuadable to not go and vote. And in elections, it's very dangerous because even if you manage to sway a a minute percent of the population, there are many elections that are lost and and won for a few thousand votes. Yeah, like I I struggle with that agency issue and the degree to which, um, not that we can be manipulated and we are affected by these phenomena, but how we are. And because I, I think a lot of this discussion ends up falling in what is possible and what potential use cases are. And in some ways, playing into the very almost like mythology that these companies are trying to create to begin with. And I think you see this in debate about behavior manipulation and ad targeting that like it really is in Facebook's interest for people to think and particularly advertisers to think that their tools are all powerful and that they can use this vast data that they have access to to manipulate voters or manipulate buyers or whatever it might be. Um, When in reality, like it might be a little more opaque. And I I guess to what degree is it really affecting human agency in your view? So I think human agency is affected when it affects the way we interact with each other. And that's just a Mm -hmm. fact. So it didn't used to be the case that you spent half an afternoon fighting strangers from your society and, and essentially yelling at each other. That, that didn't used to happen. And that's the way in which our agency at the very least has been influenced. Um, so I, you're right that I think that it's very questionable whether these ads have a big effect on people. And the best evidence we have shows that it's 
actually not that effective. But at the same time, those same methods can sway an election because you only need a very mild effect. A tiny amount, totally. Yeah. yeah. So there's a huge yeah. asymmetry that makes it incredibly risky. Mm. And then it depends on how you define affecting agency. If we think of agency as something like autonomy, and if it's true that if you have less options available to you, then your autonomy is being affected and, and therefore your agency is being affected. Well, you know, having Google decide what you, what you see on search and mm -hmm. having uh, Facebook decide what kind of opportunities you get shown when you're looking for a job and mm -hmm. having uh, Tinder decide what kind of prospective partners you mm -hmm. might be exposed to, that all seems like it's affecting agency in a pretty significant way. Like many of these kind of policy debates about the internet um, or digital technologies, we we often end up, I think, having them in the context of how we know and use technologies now, rather than where they're clearly headed. And in this domain, in the domain of either data privacy or privacy more at large, it feels to me where some of the directions that we know these technologies are headed only vastly increase these issues. And I, I think of like human augmentation and mind reading and sort of the privacy of the mind and genetic editing and kind of privacy of our genetic material or virtual worlds and all the data that will be collected in those. I mean, how do you position your views on this inside these questions and developments of technology that just vastly increase the importance, at least to me, of, of these issues. Yeah, so some of it is about questioning whether the privacy loss is necessary for whatever technology we want to develop. Mm. And many times the, quest, the, the answer is actually no, it's not, it's not necessary. Not always, of course, but many times. And it's a huge battle. So for instance, one of the secondary effects of having someone like Snowden reveal that we were being surveilled at a mass scale was that encryption took off. So like a decade ago, most of your services weren't encrypted at all. Every time you visited a website or every time you sent a message, and that has completely changed today. So we, we, th we, should, we shouldn't lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. Equally, when I started working on this topic, everyone thought that something like the GDPR was absolutely and completely impossible. Like these, the policymakers that were trying to figure out how to draft the law were being laughed at, literally. And for all its faults, it's changed the conversation worldwide and it's inspired legislation in different parts of the world. And it is having an effect, even if it's far, far from perfect and we need much better. So I think that on the one hand, yes, we will see technology that is more invasive of privacy, but we're mm. also seeing a backlash and, we, and we're seeing better regulation and we're seeing that governments are also getting worried ab about personal data being such a liability for national security. It just turns out that it's quite dangerous to have so much personal data sloshing around about your citizens because rival states like China, like Russia, really want that data and they can use it for ill. So we have already experienced Russian trolls using personal data to target people with personalized propaganda with the intent of just creating discord, creating... Um, a bad vibe between citizens because at the end of the day, civic friendship is something that is quite fundamental for a society to work well. So you, so you mentioned GDPR, so I, I want to talk a little bit about where sort of the policy direction is happening um, in this space, both in Europe and, and outside of. Um, so, so you should tell us quickly a little bit about how you view GDPR and where you think it is sufficient and insufficient at the moment. So the GDPR was incredibly important because it changed everything and nobody thought it was possible. So I, I don't want to like just bad mouth it even, even if- Yeah, no, no. first let's aspirationally talk about why it was, why it was a big step. Cause I agree with you. I think it, it really was. Yeah. One of the reasons it, it was such a big deal was that it came with this extraterritoriality condition in which it's not only companies that are based in Europe that have to comply with the law, is mm. every company around the world that wants to manage the personal data of people living in Europe. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And that's, I, that was a game changer. Well, and it's something that most other countries have picked up. I mean, that's set a real precedent, hasn't it, globally? Yeah, exactly. It was it was a, a really big deal. Also, the this this idea that um, personal data is something sensitive that people should have the right to ask for the data to be corrected if it's incorrect, to ask to see what kind of data governments have on them, the right to be able to ask for the companies to delete your data. Also, the right to be forgotten was a big deal in Europe. Um, so it has all, all kinds of like good ideas, but it's limited in, in many ways. What, what, so there are two kinds of limits. One is the limit of the law itself, and another one is the, the limit of enforcing the law, and both of those are concerns. So in terms of the law itself, um, the idea is that personal data can be collected either with people's consent or for a legitimate interest. And both of those those are actually problematic. The problem with consent is that it's incredibly burdensome for people to say no to cookies every time they go into a website. I lose so much time saying no to cookies. It's also not clear that people have the moral authority to give consent when, as we talked about, personal data is something collective and society has an interest uh, that you take care of your personal data. So so that's problematic. And then um, legitimate interest is also problematic because it's hard to interpret. It's not clear what counts as a legitimate interest. So companies have been using that as an excuse to collect personal data that they shouldn't collect. How do people understand legitimate interest? I mean, that's a it's a very opaque concept. It's a very opaque con- concept. Sometimes it's it's understood to mean something that the company needs for its for its functioning, for providing the service that people wanted to provide. Hmm. Other times it can be interpreted as something that is necessary for the public good. Hmm. So in the case of the coronavirus pandemic, there's been a lot of that. Um, so yeah, it's too fuzzy and it can lead to abuse, which leads us to the problem of enforcement. Mm. Because companies are interpreting this law in many different ways, there have been many violations. And data protection agencies are small, they're underfunded, they're understaffed, and it's very hard to pursue all the violations that are happening. And countries are enforcing them differently, right? I mean, the Irish Data Protection Authority does it interpret some of these rules very differently than other countries and enforces them in different ways. Yeah, and Ireland is a problem because Ireland has um, a conflict of interest on the one hand, it wants to keep the companies there, but it gives them a very good deal to, for the, to convince them to stay, but that means that the companies don't get scrutinized as they should. There's a complete imbalance there. Like you, I get involved in in all sorts of these policy debates um, at the moment, and I find they often drift into debates about outcomes of the structure of the system. So the the harmful speech or the bad economic activity or the manipulation, and away from some of the core structural issues. And I'm I'm wondering to what you degree you think data privacy is actually the core here, <laughs> that that some of these other things, like of course dealing with hate speech is a problem, of course dealing with market act unfairness is a problem, but do we need to get data privacy locked in first and then, like, is that our priority here? I think so, and that's one of the motivations I had for writing the book. Um, I was reading a lot of tech books that are good, that are a compilation of troublesome cases, but what I wasn't seeing is the realization that the root of the problem is the business model of exploiting personal data. So the case, the case of hate speech is a very good case. And right now the UK is debating a draft on the safety, the online safety bill. And it basically focuses on moderating content and on forcing companies to moderate content quickly. And in my view, that's a mistake because the main reason why we have so much hate speech online and so much bullying and trolling is because we have algorithms that maximize for engagement. As long as we have algorithms that maximize for engagement, we will have that kind of behavior from people. And we have algorithms that maximize engagement because of the business model that wants to collect as much personal data as possible. So if if we got rid of that business model, algorithms would be very different and they would create a very different kind of interaction between people. So one one way to get rid of the business model is to regulate the data collection 
itself or limit the data collection possibility. And that's getting rid of a type of business model, kind of a, a surveillance capitalism, you say, business model. But it, it feels to me like the trend of a lot of these digital conversations and where at least some of the technology companies and people who invest in them are going are towards kind of decentralized ownership. And whether that's the infrastructure around Web3 or new forms of interoperability. Um, what does data privacy look like in a world of NFTs and Web3 and cryptocurrencies, for example? It's a good question. Um, the honest answer is that it's too early to tell. But here are some thoughts about it. One thing that I worry about is that blockchain creates a record of every move we make. And that, mm. by definition, is bad for privacy to create a, a permanent record of everything. So in theory, you know, there are ways to make it uh, pseudonymous, to make to hash it and so on. But it seems to me that ultimately it's going to be trackable. And I think that's a problem. So I worry mm. about that. And, and it's uh, unclear to me that we'll be able to solve that in, in a way that is completely satisfying. Um, at the same time, it's true that with a decentralized architecture, it's going to be more difficult to do certain things like scrape data. At the moment, it's really easy to go into Twitter and scrape a lot of personal data from people, for instance. And that would, in theory, would be harder in a decentralized architecture. Um, but it's too, it's too early to tell. And, and a lot of people who were involved in the early days of the internet thought that the internet was decentralized and that meant it was going to be democratic and so on. And we've seen how power has nonetheless been centralized. So we'll see what the new web looks like, to what extent it is, it's actually decentralized and to what extent it can remain decentralized. I mean, just to sort of wrap this conversation a little bit, I mean, I'm struck that privacy is like an, or data privacy in particular is a really important right, clearly. But sometimes, can exist in tension with other social goods or rights. I mean, sometimes transparency is reveals all sorts of positive things or has a sort of positive effects. You talk about courtrooms in Spain, for example, um, when they opened up to the public, having changing having an effect um, on how people behaved. But in some cases, that could also lead to greater transparency. Or we see kind of harms that exist in encrypted spaces for example, um, that is a trade-off. Um, we accept those harms because encrypted communication is also very valuable. So I'm just wondering how you think through these trade-offs and privacy as, as one of many rights and values that we might have both in our lives, but also in our, our digital lives in particular. So even though there are, in some cases, some trade-offs, I think the point about trades trade-offs gets um, too much attention because for the most part, the trade-off is either non-existent or, or, or the, the benefit in, on, with privacy is so big that it's just, it's just not an issue. So the fact that we focus on these very rare instances and make a big, mm. big deal out of them, um, I think distorts the conversation. So the emphasis on having to have a lot of um, surveillance to prevent terrorism. Mm. I mean, it's an intuitive idea. I think the people who first had it had good intentions and they wanted to protect the people. You know, I can feel the pull of it. But every piece of evidence we have suggests that big data just doesn't work to prevent terrorism. I agree with you on the terrorism case, no question. I mean, that it's interesting how that got distorted for years and years following 9-11. Um, a more recent one, though, that I wonder if is a bit more nuanced in a way is is around vaccine passports. And we, it feels like we seem to collectively jump into that in a way that that showed we were willing to make that trade off. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Do you do you agree? Yeah, generally, crises are very dangerous for privacy because one of the first things to get um, to get sacrificed because it doesn't seem like a big deal. I have a chapter coming out um, in the Oxford Handbook of Digital Ethics in which I argue that that we are we're often um, tricked by something I call the surveillance delusion. And the surveillance delusion is the idea 
that surveillance has no disadvantages and all advantages, because that's what it looks like in the short term. It looks like, yeah, we can have all this data and we can do these wonderful things. And then we, we, we do surrender our privacy. And then it turns out that surveillance does have very bad effects, but they're way off in the future. And sometimes they're not quantifiable in the same way. So, you know, it's easy to calculate how many lives might be saved. It's not easy to calculate the harm to democracy. That's not something you can put into a number. And so many times it just gets discarded and we might end up losing something much more valuable um, because we couldn't quantify it. But I, in the case of vaccine passports, um, yeah, so a, a lot of the a lot of it depended on empirical questions that we didn't know the answer to, like, for instance, whether vaccines stop transmission and to, and to what degree and so on. There were a lot of questions also as to when was it appropriate to use vaccine passports? Is it only to travel, which maybe might make more sense, or is it to do anything at all? Why do vaccine passports need to be digital? That's a big thing because Many times apps not only show a particular code, but they also track you in all kinds of ways. And um, we have been using vaccine passports internationally to travel for many, many years, and they used to be on paper. So why, why do they need to be digital? So in many cases, the devil is in the details. Yeah. Do you think we should? I'm just I'm curious. Do you think we should be using them and having internationally op interoperable vaccine passports? I'm actually torn on that. I think that for traveling, it probably makes sense, especially with new variants and so on. Um, I don't think they should be electronic. Within a country, again, I'm torn. On the one hand, they might, yeah, I, I'm, I'm torn. I don't, I, I'm not sure. But in any case, if we use them, they shouldn't be electronic. Interesting, yeah. So, so just finally, in the, in, the, in the last chapter of the book, you say this is not the end of privacy, but it's the beginning of the end of of surveillance capitalism. Do you, do you think that's where we're headed? That this kind of large scale business model on which we've built the internet at the moment, the current internet is, uh, is on its way out? I hope so. I think it's a, you know, it's a kind of 50, 50% uh, chance situation. And it's up to us, what kind of world do we want to live in the future? Do we want to world, live in a world in which every conversation, every little act, every swipe on your phone gets tracked and, and, shared with hundreds of corporations that you don't know and that don't have your best interest at heart? And do we want to have political campaigns that are so incredibly invasive and questionable? Or do we want a world in which we can have intimacy and we can have private conversations and we can consult with a lawyer without being afraid that the government is listening in? Um, it's up to us. And I think it, the landscape is so bad at the moment that I tend to think that it's unsustainable, that, some, that either we're going to get our act together like we got our act together to save the ozone layer, which is um, currently recovering and will completely recover in a few years. Or we wait until something very bad happens, like personal data being used for the purposes of genocide in the West or something. Because it if it happens outside the West, unfortunately, people don't care enough. And then, and then we'll get our act together. That was my conversation with Carissa Valise. As always, you can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation in association with Antica Productions. The show is produced by Trevor Hunsberger, Debbie Pacheco, and Mitchell Stewart, with associate producer Dania Ali. Please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursdays every week.